I received a text a couple weeks ago from a friend who had listened to the first episode in this series on imposter syndrome, and she said, Jenilee, your episode made me realize that I have actually been dealing with imposter syndrome my entire life. It was, it was a game changer for her, very eye-opening. And maybe that's you. Maybe you've come to realize, either through listening to this series or from other things, that imposter syndrome or fear has surfaced some deeper issues in your soul that you didn't know were there. And the reason for that could be that you're dealing with a spiritually rooted issue of fear and not just a mental one. You see, you are a spirit, you have a body, and you have a soul. And when you deal with your thoughts, uprooting lies, and changing your thinking, then you're managing your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. That's what you're managing. And that's super important. It's healthy. We all have to do this to be (laughs) mature, healthy humans. But because you're also a spirit being, there is a spirit realm that also impacts us. And if imposter syndrome or fear that you've had to battle has felt like it's on a whole nother level beyond just dealing with some mental barriers, then it's likely that you are dealing with a spiritual root to your fear. So in this episode, we're diving into how to deal with imposter syndrome from a spiritual approach and supporting it with your healthy soul management. This is what I consider dealing with the whole man and making sure, essentially, to clean house effectively. I'm sharing with you how I deal with imposter syndrome in my own life, especially when it feels spiritually rooted. Now, don't be intimidated. Just because it has a spiritual root doesn't mean it's scary or complicated. What I'm going to teach you today will surprise you at how simple yet really effective it is, and it will bring a whole new level of freedom in your life. In fact, these principles will impact your entire family. And so let's dive in. Hi, you're listening to Java with Jen with your host, Jenna Lee Samuel. On this show, I bring the simplicity of hearing God's voice into everyday life in a no-nonsense, authentic, and super practical way. With coffee in hand and real life in our faces, let's do this. So part of what put this on the radar for me was when I received this text from another friend, a different friend. She said, random question of the day, have you ever battled imposter syndrome? And I laughed. I said, yes, so much. And she goes, tell me, how have you dealt with it? I know scripture, but I still struggle with the voices in my noggin. I struggle with a voice that tells me, I'm just in a midlife crisis and I'm just losing my marbles and that's my excuse for thinking I'm hearing God. I know it's not true, but in the midst of a revelation that God shares with me, soon after the luster wears off of that revelation, I can't shut down the voice of doubt. So what she's describing here is a picture of the harassment that can indicate that you're dealing actually with a spiritually rooted Um, experience of imposter syndrome. And so one story I wanted to share with you guys, and and this is part of what put this on my radar for you guys, because I take it for granted that I have a routine. I have a method when it comes to, to managing my soul and managing my life and managing conflicts and issues and whatever. And I am very holistic in my thinking in that I'm like, hey, I'm a body, soul, spirit. Let's deal with all three so that we deal with the issue completely, right? And part of what taught me this was back when my kids were little and the Lord, like we just weren't going to the doctor a lot. We didn't have insurance and um, the Lord was kind of had us on a little bit of a different path where we were really trying to deal with things naturally and stuff. And so whenever I would get sick or the kids would get sick, we would just pray first and say, God, what would you have us do? How should we deal with this? And there was times the Lord was like, hey, you need to take some vitamin C and you need to rest. Your immune system is down. So that meant my body was the issue. My body was weak and I needed to tend to my body. Well, then there was other times the Lord was like, hey, you actually are carrying a lot of unforgiveness in your heart and you need to let go of that. You need to release that. It's causing a lot of stress and it's opened the door for the enemy to come, come, come attack you or whatever. And so that was in my soul, my emotions, right? I need to repent and I needed to let go of unforgiveness. And then there was other times that the Lord was like, hey, you need to take authority over a spirit of infirmity and release healing in your home. And so then that was a spiritual approach. So when I witnessed that over the years, the Lord, you know, maybe the same issue, the fever, the flu, the whatever, 
there would sometimes be different approaches that the Lord would have me deal with it. And I realized, okay, so sometimes these symptoms can come up above the surface and look the same, but that doesn't always mean the root is the same. And that's because we are a a triune being. I have three dimensions to who I am, a soul, a body, and a spirit. So when it comes to things like imposter syndrome, and wrestling any kind of any kind of aspect of your life where there's brokenness either emotional brokenness physical brokenness financial brokenness relational brokenness any any place where there's brokenness that's where we have somehow one way or another stepped out of alignment with God's divine um, order, right? Like the kingdom of God, there's no brokenness in heaven, right? And he says he wants us to bring heaven to earth, right? And so Anywhere that you experience brokenness and fracturedness in your life, um, you can look at it and go, okay, God, how do I deal with this? What's the root of this issue? And it can be a variety of things. It can be generational and you're fighting against a generational infirmity or not infirmity, um, iniquity, like a sin, a sin pattern that's on your family line that you're going to have to fight through and push through and get a breakthrough on. And those are harder battles. I'll be honest. Those are harder battles. Sometimes it's just... Um, patterns you've built and habits of thinking that you've built in your own life that you've got to deal with. And and sometimes it's simple as choices. You've been making unhealthy food choices. So now your body is having health issues. You know, there could be any variety, but the important thing is that again, hearing God's voice is essential to your everyday life in this way, because when you see these areas of brokenness in your life, that's okay. You just go to the Lord and say, Holy Spirit, What's the root of this? How do I deal with this? Is this rooted in my soul? Do I need to correct my thinking? Is this something that I, with my words, opened up a door for this or released a curse on my life with my words because my words have authority? Um, Have my words made room for the enemy to attack? Or there's just so many different ways. So with imposter syndrome, that is something that happens primarily in our thinking, right? In, in the processing of your mind being like, I'm not enough. I'm insufficient. I'm afraid. I can't do this. I don't have what it takes. All those thoughts. It can be, it is part of sometimes our human experience. When you're pushing against barriers, when you're pushing against limitations, when you're doing something new, your brain is hardwired to protect you and keep you safe. And when something is new and your brain doesn't have a map in its head, in your head for it, because your brain wants a map, because it it says, I know where to go to stay safe, right? When it's something new and your brain doesn't have a map, it freaks out. And it's like, this is unfamiliar territory. I don't know where things are unsafe. So it's all unsafe. So let's stay away, right? So that's what your brain does. Well, just because your brain is doing that doesn't mean it's true and doesn't mean that's where you need to live. But sometimes things can be spiritually rooted. And, And in the text from my friend where she said, I still struggle. She said, I know scripture, but I still struggle with the voices in my head. I struggle with a voice that tells me I'm just in a midlife crisis and I'm losing my marbles and that that's my excuse for thinking I'm hearing God. So that line right there is what told me she's dealing with a spiritual issue because of the fact that it has a tone of condemnation, accusation, and harassment. And that is what the voice of the enemy sounds like. And so I'm going to give you a couple examples of where I've experienced imposter syndrome in my life or in someone's life that I know. And so I so that you can kind of see the difference between, okay, this is more spiritually rooted or this is maybe um, just kind of a natural experience that needs to be dealt with with some just mental changes and some thought changes, right? Okay, so first one is an example of... Um, a long time ago when I was asked to preach somewhere. And this was like one of the first times I was asked to preach in this kind of a setting. And I was feeling very overwhelmed suddenly with all kinds of disqualifying thoughts over sinful choices and mistakes I had made way in my past. It had been years prior I had made some mistakes and, and made some poor choices. And suddenly, now that I was being presented with this opportunity... All of those past mistakes and past issues were surfacing and I was, I, was, I was being tormented, honestly, with the shame of those things and the feelings of, of being disqualified and like, who am I to get up and preach when this is on my track record, you know? And 
Maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you've wanted to start a Bible study or a small group or minister to one of your coworkers. And immediately you have these disqualifying thoughts of, well, yeah, but don't you remember when you did this? Don't you remember screaming at your kids? Don't you remember this? Don't you remember that? And so I had to wrestle through that, but it was so harassing. It, it felt tormenting, like, like I was just tied up in knots on the inside. It was so tormenting. And so I finally recognized this has a spiritual root. This is the voice of accusation, condemnation, and shame. And so I had to then go into a place of almost like battle, spiritual battle, where not crazy wild craziness, just what I'm about to describe, where I I drew a line in my heart and mind and I said, you know what, Satan? God has forgiven me. He has redeemed me. He has freed me from those things. And this is no longer something you get to hold against me because God has separated my sin from me. As far as the East is from the West, he has forgiven me and it is not in his mind about me. So it will not be in my mind about me as well. And I just basically told the devil, shut up. Right. And so I had to step into that place of faith, trusting that God's grace and mercy was enough. Right. So that's a, that's a picture of a spiritually rooted experience with imposter syndrome, all those disqualifying thoughts because of shameful decisions that I'd made in the past, right? Well, here's another example. Someone that I love very dearly was telling me about how she's always kind of wrestled with her body image. And she decided to sign up for um, a type of dance class. And of course, the walls are covered in mirrors and she was struggling with it because she hasn't, she hasn't been working out in a long time. And so her body wasn't as strong as it used to be. She's always been a a dancer of sorts, um, but her body just wasn't as strong as it used to be. And she was really struggling. And, but what she was really struggling with wasn't so much even how she was dancing. It's that when she saw herself in the mirror, she had a barrage of all these thoughts of like, you're disgusting. I can't believe you're even trying this. Look at you. No one wants to look at that, you know, and just all these horrible, horrible thoughts as she described them to me over the phone. I literally started crying because they were such hateful, mean thoughts. And I told her, I said, you are my friend. And I am not okay with your thoughts talking to you like that. That is cruel. I would never talk to you like that. And you should not allow your mind to talk to you like that either. And she, she was like, I know that. But it's like, it's like a fire hose that turns on and I can't turn it off. And I said, okay, it sounds like this is a spiritually rooted problem. And you need to deal with this spiritually as well as mentally. And so we identified that because she had aligned herself with self-hatred instead of self-love or loving herself in a healthy way, she had to actually go in and repent for that self-hatred to break agreement with those thoughts and align herself with a spirit of love. And, And so she had to go through this repentance process. And so that, that's an example of imposter syndrome that is driven by a spiritual root. So here's another example. Um, now this example is when I, I shared it in one of the first episodes on this series where I had been asked by a business to be a business consultant for them. And I suddenly was overwhelmed with all these feelings of inadequacy because I realized this is a $12 million business company that's asking me to tell them how to run their company and I've never even been to college like I felt like a total fish out of water but it wasn't harassing and it was very brief because I knew in my heart the Lord had dropped that idea in my heart the day before so I knew the Lord was leading me into this and it was just like little thoughts that popped up like oh oh I don't know if I can do this oh am I really cut out for this? But in my heart, I had peace because I knew the Lord was in it. And so I was able to easily deal with those thoughts and put them aside and choose not to meditate on them and say, you know what? I might not be qualified on a practical level, but if the Lord's leading me or he, me here, he's going to give me grace and he's going to give me wisdom to do this. So that's an example of a much less harassing, much less tormenting situation where imposter syndrome popped up 
but I had peace in my heart and I was able to easily deal with the thoughts, right? So that's, I'm, I'm sharing both because I want you to see a contrast. Um, that one was just more your average, normal human experience of this is new territory. I'm not qualified on paper. Can I really do this? But I had assurance in my heart because the Lord had led me there, right? And so that last example is more of a, a soul realm issue with imposter syndrome. I just had to deal with my thoughts and choose not to meditate on those thoughts, right? So in this episode, though, we're going to dive into the ones like the previous two examples where it's harassing, where it's tormenting, and where it's a spiritual route to an emotional issue, right? Sometimes imposter syndrome or the feeling of not quite being enough can be nagging, can be harassing, and can feel like a barrage of horrible thoughts. And when this is the case, it is a spiritually rooted issue. And there is a simple way you can deal with this. Matthew 6, 22 through 23 says, The eye, the way you look at things, is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light or full of revelation, full of understanding. But if your eyes are unhealthy, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Essentially, this passage is emphasizing the importance of having a healthy perspective and a healthy focus. And so when you deal with things spiritually, you've got to address the spirit. You've got to address the spiritual things with your spiritual acts, if you will, cut it at the root. But then you do have to follow it up with dealing with things with your soul, dealing with how you're looking at things, how you're thinking of things, right? So if your vision is clouded and focused on the wrong things, then your entire life will be filled with darkness and negativity. But if your eyes are focused on what is good, your vision is clear and you're seeing things as God sees things, then your whole life will be filled with light and goodness. And that is what we're after here. I'm, I'm trying to help you learn how you can deal with the root that would convolute your view and make your eyes full of darkness. We don't want that. We want your eyes full of light and revelation. So as you move through your life, you can easily deal with um, situations with peace and with boldness and confidence like we talked about in the earlier episodes. So I want to introduce the idea that a spirit of harassment is actually a spirit of fear. And in the, in the spirit realm, there are spirits. The way you can identify what spirit is at work is you look at what is the effect of it. What is the fruit of it in your life? So if you're dealing with a lot of anxiety and you're always, you're always waking in the middle of the night with night terrors and nightmares or you have a fear of death or you're super untrusting and have a lot of doubt about just life and situations and yourself, if you carry a lot of anxiety and stress or you have a lot of fear, man, you're really worried about what people think of you. Um, you have a lot of phobias and like your OCD about all these different things, or you just have a lot of torment in your soul. Okay. That is all of those things are fruits of a spirit of fear. And so imposter syndrome falls in that category. Imposter syndrome, while it is a human experience of our brain coming up against limitations and kind of freaking out for a moment, you're not supposed to live there. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like growing pains, right? When you're growing, it may be uncomfortable at first, your, your joints ache and all this stuff. But as you grow, those pains go away, right? You, you grow into your new size, your body evens out, it regulates itself, and it, those pains go away. Well, if those pains persisted, we would say, okay, something else is at work here. Something else is a problem here, right? So same thing here. Imposter syndrome can surface as a type of growing pain, if you will, when you're trying something new, you're pushing beyond your limits, you're exploring new territory. But if it persists because you've, and you've tried to deal with it, whatever, and it persists, we're dealing with something else. You may be dealing with a spirit of fear. Okay. So second Timothy one says what second Timothy one seven says for the spirit of God does not Wait, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid and afraid, but instead it gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So the spirit of God is going to make you feel emboldened, full of courage, and confidence, right? And so if you find yourself living in that space of fear, you need to deal with a deeper root. 
Now, when I recognize that I'm dealing with a deeper root, kind of like I in that first example where I was dealing with shame um, over past issues, you, ha- you need to stop and you need to do some work. Take 30 minutes. It doesn't have to take a very long time. And if you don't even have 30 minutes, it doesn't even have to take that long. It can take 30 seconds, honestly. Um, and here's, here's what I do. Um, now, first... It is important if you have the 30 minutes to step aside and you realize like I've just been dealing with this in a major way, in an ongoing way. Um, Realize that dealing with it spiritually is kind of like, oh, what's an example? Um, Okay, it's kind of like if you're if you're trying to lose weight and you clean out your kitchen, right? You get all the junk food out of the house. You deal with you deal with the source of the problem. You get all the junk food out of the house. But you still have an ongoing journey of maintaining, right? You have to keep the junk food out of the house. You still have to make better health food decisions. You still have to choose to exercise. So there's, it's a partnership between deal with the root, do make an initial action plan, but then you have to maintain. So when you're dealing with things like a spirit of fear, you've got kind of this dual dynamic at work. You deal with the spirit, address it in the spirit, But then you have to maintain it and live it out in the daily decisions of walking in cooperation with God's spirit and a healthy soul, right? So I want you to understand that just because you pray a prayer once or just because you lay the ax to the root of the tree doesn't mean that you're, you don't have some work to do, you know, as far as keeping a healthy heart and keeping a healthy mind and keeping the door closed from the enemy, right? So one of the things that is important is when you sit down holding space and and making space for you to journal out all your thoughts and feelings. That's part of how you will be able to possibly identify and bring light to what are the things that are keeping you bound? What are the things you're dealing with? If you don't ever slow down and journal or slow down and process what's happening on the inside of you, you're never going to get clear on what's happening on the inside of you. So obviously that's not rocket science. It's again, very simple. That's the beauty of it. So step one is always hold space for yourself to put words and voice to your feelings, write it out. It's an important part of exposing and releasing those things that torment you while they're hidden in your heart. Those things that are hidden in your heart that torment you, your body's always trying to move you towards health. And so those things will constantly surface because your heart and your mind are actually always trying to move you towards healing. And so they're going to surface. They're going to like nag and, and kind of like loop, right? Until you get closure and can release them. So they'll always look for resolution or release. So you need to give voice to it on paper. Create an outlet for those things to get out. And so when you sit down, we talked about this in the, in the previous episodes, when you sit down and you journal, there's something about, let's say I've got this looping thought of I'm not enough, I'm not enough, I'm not enough, right? This looping thought. If I never sit down and write it out on paper, it can actually just kind of live on a loop in my mind. But there is something about, Dr. Caroline Leaf talks about the power of how your brain can disassociate in a healthy way when you're writing on paper. So when something's stuck in your mind, it loops, it's very personal, you can't disassociate. It's embedded in who you are, it's, it's going on on the inside. But when you sit down and you write something on paper, your brain is now able to look at that thought objectively and say, oh, yeah, I don't want that. And then it can decide, yeah, we're not going to pick that one back up. And it can leave it on the paper and you can move on and find a lot of release that way. That's the power of journaling. So there is something very impactful for your mental process and your brain to let go of things that are stuck on a loop just by journaling. So that's step one. Sit down and journal out the area where you feel like you're wrestling and you're struggling and you're just dealing with imposter syndrome, right? Ephesians 5 verse 13 and 14 describes that dynamic like this. It says, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. So when you sit down to write things down, it becomes visible. Clarity comes, right? And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. It becomes a revelation like, oh, this is what's happening. That is why it said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. And so this is, it's saying essentially like, the goal of getting free or one of the methods of getting free is to bring is to expose what is done in darkness to expose the the things that harass inside your mind and stay kind of hidden on the inside you actually want to 
release them and get them out, expose them. And writing them on paper is one way to do that. Talking it out with a friend is another way to do that. But writing it on paper and journaling it is such a powerful part of the process. So that is what I would say is step one. Take time to journal. In, in your journaling, you can do this. You can ask the Lord this. Say, Lord, what lies am I believing that are causing me to feel like an imposter? And then you sit and you wait, you listen, and you write whatever comes to mind. It's important that you don't filter and edit or judge what you're writing. Just just write. Get it out. Don't judge yourself. Just write it. Because your heart is going to be talking to you. Your, your soul is trying to release these things that are unhealthy. And so you have to make room for it to do that. When we jump in and we try to edit and filter and judge the stuff coming out, your heart can't speak truly freely. And so you need to ask the Lord, what lies am I believing causing me to feel like an imposter? And just write it down. Sit and listen and they'll come quickly. Usually they will come quickly. I do this with my kids too. When they're demonstrating a lot of misbehavior, I've had them sit down. Okay, buddy, you're acting a whole lot of like this. And this is out of character for you. I want you to sit down and ask the Holy Spirit, what lie am I believing that's driving my behavior? And they'll, it's amazing what they'll write, like I'm not enough or um, nobody loves me or whatever it is. They'll write it down and then I'll say, and then, and I'll kind of write prompts on paper so they can just follow their prompts and do it all privately. And then they'll bring it to me later. And I'll say, and the next prompt is, okay, Lord, what is the truth? And then they'll write down, what does the Lord say is the truth? And I'm just teaching them to get still and to listen and to tap into their inner world and manage it. So the first step is journaling. And in your journaling, ask the Lord, what lies am I believing that are causing me to feel like an imposter? And then write down those lies. Because again, we're trying to expose the darkness. And so by writing down the lies, we're exposing the lies so that we can get free from them, right? Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Even this process of writing down these lies is a process of trusting the Lord to walk with us, to keep us. Okay. Um, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5, 3 through 5 says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, guns and swords. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Strongholds are elevated ways of thinking that elevate and and, um, become like a, like a, a stronghold. It becomes a limiting belief in our life. We demolish arguments and every pretension, every idea that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, the truth of God, the thing that God would say about you. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. When you sit and journal and you ask the Lord to expose lies you're believing, you are doing exactly what the scripture describes, taking captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's the process, right? So simple. It's not complicated to do this stuff, right? So you're journaling, you're asking God what lies you're believing. And then the next step is you ask the Lord, Is there anyone that I need to forgive that's causing me to stay stuck in that lie? And then I write that down. And the reason why I include this is because the Bible talks about how a root of bitterness um, defiles many. Like that says, do not allow a root of bitterness to spring up in you, defiling many. And so bitterness and unforgiveness is something that can make us blind to the lies we're believing, to the things we're operating in, and can really just skew our vision. And kind of like that scripture where our vision is dark, our, our eyes are dark, the lamp of our eyes is dark. Unforgiveness and bitterness can cause the lamp of our eyes to be dark and, and the, our whole inner world to be dark. And so we want to deal with unforgiveness. So after you ask the Lord, what lies am I believing? Then you ask the Lord, is there anyone I need to forgive? that's causing me to stay stuck in this lie. And you write down every name that the Lord brings to you, okay? And once you do, um, the next step is ask the Lord, God, what is the truth that needs to replace this lie? And when you're writing down people that you need to forgive, even in that step, you can go through the forgiveness process. You can say, God, forgive me for holding on to unforgiveness towards this person. I release them. 
I release them into your care and your hands. I release them to you to bring justice, you to deal with that situation. But I'm not going to hold on to bitterness. I'm not going to let unforgiveness defile me. And you just release them. God, I ask you, and here's a key to forgiveness, is blessing. Say, God, I ask that you would bless them. I ask you bless them in their health, in their hearts, in their relationships, in their finances. Bless them right? And that'll shift your heart and you will feel lighter. You will feel things start to shift in your own personal atmosphere as you're doing this. The next step, of course, is ask the Lord, what is the truth that needs to replace the lie I've been believing? Because now that you've gotten kind of your heart cleansed um, from unforgiveness, you can say, God, what is the truth that needs to replace this lie? And then you just write whatever it brings to mind. Let's say the lie is my voice is never going to make, no one, no one is going to believe me. No one's going to believe anything I say, right? That's a lie I've had to deal with before. No one's going to believe anything that I say. And if that's a lie you're believing, and, and here's a little side caveat. There are times that lies that you believe are not lies that you created. Like they're not lies that you invented. They could have been lies you inherited, inherited either genetically, like because beliefs and Um, feelings and emotions can be coded into your DNA. That's called epigenetics. And so you can literally be believing out of inherited lies. And so that's why you don't want to have judgment or shame towards any of it. It might not even make sense why you're believing that lie. That's okay. It might not be the lie that you ever created in your life. It could have been inherited, something you learned from your parents or learned from wherever. The main issue is that we're dealing with it, right? doesn't Don't get hung up on whose fault it is. Just deal with it. So when you identify the lie, forgive the people you need to forgive. Ask the Lord what's the truth that needs to replace this lie. And then you you do your repentance and your realignment. And so once I identify lies and whatever, then I repent for aligning with these lies. Because you've got to break agreement first before you can just adopt a new belief, right? You've got to break agreement. You've got to break up with it. Tell your brain and your soul and your spirit and the devil, I'm not participating with this anymore. And that's part of how you cleanse spiritually. It feels like a spiritual bath. It's wonderful. So you go into repentance. You just say, God, I repent for aligning with these lies, the lie that no one's going to believe my voice or the lie that I'm not enough or the lie of whatever. And I repent for cooperating with fear and with these lies. And I break agreement with them in Jesus name. And I literally, literally say that out loud. I break agreement with this lie in Jesus name. And then I take authority over any tormenting spirit that would try to use anything against me. And here's how you take authority, guys. It's so simple. You just say, literally, because your words have power. If you're in covenant with God, you're, you're a believer. Your words have power. You say, I take authority right now over every work of the enemy. Every lie, every assault, every tormenting spirit, every spirit of fear that would try to use my past sins or anything against me. Every sin I've committed is forgiven and washed under the blood of Jesus and is separated from me as far as the east is from the west. So I take authority over the spirit of fear. I take authority over whatever it is, fill in the blank. And I release over myself the truth that God says, which is that I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. That there is anointing on my life. That my words have the power of life and death. And that I will love it and eat its fruit. And you just begin to release the truth in place of that lie. Okay? And here's what you want to do. You want to verbally confess and claim these truths. Because aside from spiritually and the whole spirit realm, hearing your voice, because your voice matters in the spirit realm. You have no idea. Your voice, side tangent, your voice echoes in eternity. I don't know if you know this. The sound of your voice never stops reverberating. Kind of like when you throw a rock in the water and the ripple keeps going and going until it hits the whole other side. Like you can watch it go on and on and on and on and on. That's how your voice is in the spirit. It doesn't stop. And so your prayers and your decrees and your voice echo in eternity for all eternity. They don't stop. And so they go before the throne of God. And so when you pray over your children, you pray over your life, these prayers echo. And guys, this is why your words matter. 
This is why your confessions over your life and over your children matter because your words have power and your words echo through eternity. And the enemy is watching your words and listening as much as angels are waiting for your words to be the word of God. Angels, um, the Bible says that angels hearken into the voice of the, of the word, the voice of God. And so when you release the spoken word of God, when you release truths off of your lips, angels are activated to take action on those things. If you didn't hear those episodes on the activation of angels, you're going to want to go back and listen somewhere in the, somewhere in the recent few months. Um, those were powerful episodes. But your words either activate angels or they create permissions for the enemy to have access way into your life to steal, kill, and destroy because that's what he does, right? And so if your words are constantly saying, I'm not enough, nobody's going to listen to me, my kids don't even listen to me, anything like that, listen, you are creating a world with your words. Your words create worlds. They do because God put authority on your words. It's there. Whether you are aware of it or not, the authority is on your words over your life, over your kids' lives, and everything you've been given authority over, your words have authority. And so if you're not going to acknowledge that and embrace it and use it with wisdom, you're still going to reap the result of the fact that your words have authority. And so if you're using your words recklessly and carelessly and just talking out of your emotions, you're creating lots of access points for the enemy to be at work in your life. So that's why I say writing down and thinking, God, who, who do I need to forgive? And I will actually also say, God, have I spoken any words out loud that have created opportunity for the enemy? And I will wait and I'll listen and I will let the Lord. Sometimes he will bring up many different instances where I have spoken things that created doorways for the enemy. And so when you identify the lies, when you identify words you've spoken or anything like that, you close those doors through the repentance and the breaking of agreement. And then once you've done that, you fill it, you fill those spaces with the truth. You've got to fill those spaces back up. There's a passage in the New Testament that talks about when a, when a house is cleaned, um, the, oh, I, I should have looked it up, but essentially it was talking about that a spirit is looking for a place to live. And when a house, the theoretical house, talking about you, like your life is cleaned, but then, and everything's put in order, except nothing is filled it, then the spirit will come back with sevenfold more powerful. I am botching and destroying this scripture. The principle I'm trying to get at is when you clean house spiritually, it's not enough just to get the bad stuff out. You've got to put the good stuff in because if you don't put good stuff in, there's nothing taking up residence there. The enemy is just going to try to come back right to that same old place and except it'll be potentially worse because he's bringing buddies with him. So if you're new to spiritual um, warfare and spiritual dynamics like this, I'm trying to keep it really simple without getting too far down the rabbit hole with you. Um, because honestly, dealing with things spiritually is simple. So let's, let's pan out and let's look at this again. The way to deal with imposter syndrome, if it is spiritually rooted, is A, if there is an experience of your imposter syndrome that is very harassing, producing a lot of anxiety, no matter what you do, it feels like you can't get on top of it, and it feels like it's much more than just correcting some thinking, then you may be dealing with a spiritually rooted issue. If it is spiritually rooted, sit down, take some time with the Lord to set order spiritually in your life. First thing you do is you journal. You sit down, sit with the Lord, and you start to journal. Journal out your thoughts and feelings. Get them on paper so your brain can easily and objectively look at your thoughts and say, hmm, I want to break up with that, or yep, we'll keep that. As you get your thoughts on paper, you then need to ask the Lord, um, are there any lies that I've been believing that you want to deal with right now? And are, are there any lies that I've been believing that have been keeping me in poverty? Are there lies I've been believing that have been keeping my relationships in conflict? Are there lies, whatever your issue is, right? Whatever you're trying to address, ask the Lord, what are the lies I've been believing that have caused me to feel so harassed in my heart by imposter syndrome? And then you write the lies down. Then you ask the Lord, God, who do I need to forgive? And are there any words I've spoken that have created this access point? Write those down. 
Who do I need to forgive? And what have I said? What are words I've said that I need to break the power of? And then the third step is I ask the Lord, what is the truth that needs to replace the lie? And once you've written all these things down, you can go through the cleansing, the, this cleansing process of repenting of the lies that you've believed, repenting for, and you, listen, repentance is simple. It's not, you don't have to drag it out for hours. <laughs> repentance is as simple as God forgive me. The Bible says in James 1, 9, or uh, James 1, 9, I think, um, 1 John 1, 9, where it says, confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness very simple. You confess your sins because God is faithful and just to forgive them and then to cleanse you of them. Very simple. So all I do is I say, God, I wrote down this lie. I'm like, God, forgive me for partnering with the lie and agreeing with the lie and confessing the lie that I, that my words will not be taken seriously. And then I say, God, forgive me for holding this against so-and-so. I ask that you would bless them in their health and finances. God, forgive me for opening my mouth and releasing either curses over myself or speaking in alignment with the lie that you've just shown me is not true. I break agreement with all of these things and I, and I, um, I tear down the power of my words that have agreed with those lies in Jesus' name and I bind up every destructive work that was activated in my life as a result. And instead, I confess right now and I decree over my life the truth of what you say, which is that my words have power, that the Spirit of God is listening when I'm speaking, that the prayers of a righteous man avail much, that the anointing on my life is going to make an impact, that I'm the head and so you begin to release the truth. And then, essentially, that's how you deal with it. You just, you, you identify it, you bind and repent, well, you repent and bind and then you loose, right? The Bible says that um, if you, let's see, where is it? That whatever is bound in heaven will be bound on earth and whatever is loosed in heaven will be loosed on earth. I don't remember the location of that passage, but essentially when you bind things in the spirit, they are bound in your life. When you loose things in the spirit, they are loose. And that's because your words have authority and power. So when dealing with an imposter syndrome, issue that is spiritually rooted. Take time to identify what you've been believing. Identify lies you've been believing. Take a, like repent for agreement with those things. Take authority over those things. And you can literally, you can ask the Lord, God, is there a spirit that has been harassing me? Or what spirits do I need to take authority over? There are times in my life where the atmosphere of my home feels a little bit discombobulated, or there's maybe a lot of conflict or strife or whatever. Again, part of how you know what spirit you're dealing with is look at the fruit that's being, that's being produced in your life. So I find that there's been times there's a lot of fear. People in my family are having bad dreams. People in my family are dealing with a lot of insecurity, whatever. I will go and spiritually cleanse and I will say, God, I take authority over a spirit of fear over my home. And I loose, I bind that spirit of fear and its evil work. And I loose over my home, the spirit of peace and the spirit of God and the spirit of love in Jesus name, right? It's that simple. You can do it as you're walking through your house, literally. And so look at the fruits that are being produced in your life. Look at the fruits being produced in your family's lives. And that's how you can identify what spirit that you may be dealing with. Um, now I just want to, caveat this some people when they're new to this go a little off the deep end and then everything is a spirit of this and a spirit of that listen don't get crazy people yes there are spirits of this and there are spirits of that we deal with it and we move on we don't linger there do not give the devil more attention than he deserves and he doesn't deserve much of any right Jesus is the one that deserves our attention and our words and our communication so deal with what you need to deal with and move on into the truth. Give your attention to the things of the Lord. Don't give your attention to the things of the enemy. Deal with it. Move forward. That is my philosophy. Devil does not need to get any more credit than he already gets. So that's what I, that's my approach to dealing with, um, imposter syndrome is recognize that sometimes It is a natural part of your human experience, but usually that's a little easier to deal with than if it's a spiritually rooted, spiritually harassing thing. 
if it's spiritually harassing, it's something that's very crippling to you. Maybe it's something you've experienced your whole life. Maybe it's on your family bloodline. Then you need to deal with it more aggressively and you need to deal with it spiritually. Go in and say, God, show me the lies that I've been believing. Show me the lies that have kept me bound. Show me the lies that have kept me crippled. We are going to do some house cleaning. Repent, deal with it, find the truths that God says that are to replace it. And then you release things, those things over you. I'm going to give you, I'm going to end with a story as an illustration of how I did this. If you've been listening to my podcast for a while, it's possible you've heard this story, but we're just going to go into it because it really fits this context. So there was a time when my husband and I were, um, we were meeting with this couple. And so we hadn't met with them in a while, uh, like for counseling, for couples counseling. And so I messaged our little four-way group thread and said, hey guys, we haven't met in a while. I was wondering, you know, when would be a good time for us to connect again? Well, nobody responded to my message, like nobody at all. And remember, like I said, one of the lies I've dealt with in my life is that no one, no one listens to you. Like your voice doesn't matter. Why is the Lord, why is the enemy going to put that lie against me? Why? Because it's, he's trying to undermine the anointing on my life, which is my voice, right? So anyways, that's the lie I'd been dealing with, but I messaged the group thread. Nobody responds. Well, then later I find out that the other husband had messaged my husband. Actually, I think he messaged in the group and was like, um, was like addressed my husband instead of addressing me. It was like, Steven, what's a good time? And it was kind of like they were talking over my head, but never like actually talking to me. And I realized that they were communicating privately because this, this guy was trying to help challenge my husband to take initiative and to be a spiritual leader in our marriage, you know, and and to take an initiative in our marriage to help, you know, pursue these things. And, um, so that's the reason he wasn't responding to me, but because he was responding to Steven in the group thread and talking to Steven, but not ever acknowledging me, I felt totally overlooked and bypassed. And so I found myself wanting to like respond like with a rant and like kind of raging. Like I could tell I was triggered up over it. And so I I go in the bathroom and I'm like crying and I'm like, Jenna Lee, you are crying over him not messaging you back. This is a little excessive. What is the problem here? And so when I acknowledged and recognized, okay, my behavior is a, is more than what the situation merits. Then I realized, oh, a button in my soul has been pushed. I need to deal with this. So that means I've been believing a lie. And so I stopped. And instead of being so fixated on the situation that was making me feel triggered, I stopped. And I said, Lord, what lie am I believing that's causing me to feel this way? And the Lord immediately brought to mind, he said, that your voice doesn't matter. And and, and when he said that, it it felt like an aha on the inside, like a revelation of truth. And so I recognized it and I said, oh, yes, like that's what was antagonized in my heart. And so I said, Lord, what's the truth? And the Lord just spoke to me, said, Jenny, your voice matters. Your voice has great authority. Your voice has anointing. Your voice matters. And they're not actually overlooking you. He's trying to lead your husband. He's trying to guide your husband in being a spiritual leader. And so when I recognized the truth and the lie, I said, you know what, Lord, I break up with the lie that my voice doesn't matter. I choose not to partner with that lie. I thank you that the truth is my voice does matter. And so right there, I felt all this peace fill my soul. And suddenly I was no longer bothered or irritated by the situation anymore. And I could see it more appropriately. I could see it for what it was. He was trying to help my husband take initiative. And so right there is an illustration of that passage that says your eye is the lamp of the body. And if, if the eyes are full of darkness, how great is that darkness? Your whole body is full of darkness, right? So as long as I was believing that lie, my whole human experience was having this reaction, this horrible reaction to the way he had handled the situation. And, and because of my skewed perspective, he became my enemy. That other guy became my enemy. These men became horrible people that were just chauvinistic and talking over the top of me. You know what I mean? Like it skewed my whole reality. But then when the, I let the Lord deal with the lie in my heart and I realized this lie is skewing things. 
and I stepped into the truth, suddenly I could see it for what it was. And so that is, that is the, that is kind of an illustration of like walking through the steps of what I just described. And so I, I did in that process, I repented of cooperating with that lie and I bound the liar. I said, you will not lie to me in this way, Satan. My voice is powerful. God has anointed my voice and I'm going to use my voice. And I stepped back into peace. I saw the situation more rightly and I found some freedom in my soul. And so that's an illustration of this process I've just described to you. It has the ability to set you free from things that have bound you for years, whether that's imposter syndrome or something else, this same principle. And you can teach this to your kids, friends. Teach this to your kids. It is so simple. Kids are, can get so good at this and you're teaching them how to manage their inner world when you teach them this. The principles in today's episode are so powerful. Journal, identify the lies, repent of, of participating with those lies and repent of unforgiving, holding unforgiveness towards anyone or any words that you have spoken over your own life, etc. Repent of those things. And then take up the truth that God says about you and that God has for you. And then choose to agree with those things. And you'll find that your life will align with peace. The harassment that has come against you will either slow down. And sometimes you have to continue to take a stance against the enemy. If there is a spirit of harassment coming at you, then sometimes you have to stand and continue to stand. You know, it's not always just a one and done. Sometimes you have to stand and continue standing. But always use your word to take authority over the enemy. You have the power to bind him. What is bound in heaven is bound on earth. What is loosed in heaven is loosed on earth. And so essentially, I've just taught you the principles of binding and loosing and navigating the spiritual realm, taking your authority in the spirit realm over your life in a very practical way. This is so, so powerful and can change things in your life and is so good for teaching to your children as well. Okay. I hope that made sense. Um, I'm really hoping that that made sense. Let me know if you listen to this, let me know if this was helpful or if you guys are like, you know, could you write something down and have it available for us? Um, let me know. But what I'll do is I'll drop in the show notes, kind of my basic step one, step two, step three, step four. I'll write that in the show notes. So at least you can copy it and drop it into a note in your phone or something if you'd like so that you have that uh, when you do decide to sit down and journal and maybe deal with some stuff. But listen, you have more spiritual authority in your singular person than the whole army of demons that may try to come against you. You have all authority in heavenly places because of what Christ did for you on the cross. And you have inherited that by your faith and by your um, salvation. And so you can change your whole entire life with the principles I shared today. So I'm excited to hear what comes from this. Let me know what you thought. Let me know if you um, take action with this and see some changes in your life. I would love to hear that from you guys. Please, please, please. I love hearing from y'all. So come follow me on Instagram at Java with Jen. Send me a message. Send me a DM. Let me know if you took action with this episode and saw some changes in your life and some shifts. Um, Also, for those of you who don't know, if you wanted to support the show as a sponsor, you can, and by a sponsor, I mean monthly donations to help cover the cost of keeping the show going. You can do that at Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Java with Jen, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Java with Jen. And you could sign up to be a sponsor of the show. That's five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, whatever fits um, your budget and what you'd like to do. I already have a number of sponsors that literally they keep my show running and I am so, so, so grateful. And so if you didn't know about it, you'd like to come on board. I would invite you to come be a part. It's patreon.com slash Java with Jen. Otherwise I'll see you on Instagram. Stay tuned. We have some experts coming on next week diving into uh, imposter syndrome on a whole nother level. It's going to be super good. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show. Listen, let's stay connected. Come follow me on Instagram at Java with Jen, where you can follow the latest and say, hey, it's a really great way to stay in touch. Many of you have also asked how you can support the show. You can make donations through the Anchor app or on Patreon, or of course, by sharing, rating, and reviewing on social media and iTunes as well. Your heartfelt feedback always reminds me why I do this. 
Also, don't miss our merch store where you can get super cool Java with Jen swag and coffee. Find it at javawithjenmerch.com. Until next time, remember, hearing God's voice is simple and he wants to be a part of your everyday life. See you next week.